What is up guys, it's your friendly neighborhood web war fanatic and today we will be reviewing the Marvel Champions Age of Apocalypse expansion. So let's go ahead and get started here. So I have this chart with all the heroes, so Bishop and Magic, and we have Eunice, Four Horsemen, Apocalypse, Dark Beast, and Apocalypse 2. These are the five villains in the box. And then I'll also be uh, ranking and reviewing the uh, the mission team, so that's going to be like the campaign stuff. And this is uh, Pursued by the Past, the standard three uh, module set that came with this box. And then uh, I created these categories here. If they are fun, unique, have interesting decisions, uh, are powerful, and then the wow factor, and then uh, their overall rating for each part. And uh, I didn't put the aspect cards in here, but don't worry, I will be doing that in a future video, but I think that's gonna be a long video because I'll be updating my um, tier list for all the like supports, upgrades, and allies. So that's gonna be in a future video. But for now, we're just gonna um, review all the stuff that's in the box. So let's go ahead and get started here with the first hero, uh, Bishop. So, uh, spoiler alert, if you guys have been following my channel, you guys know that I absolutely love Bishop. So I'm gonna go ahead and reveal what I have for him. So I think he has everything that I want in a hero. Bishop is super awesome. He's super duper fun. Um, yeah, I think he is a five out of five. I think he has the fun factor. He has very unique mechanic, unique hero cards, a unique kit. And he kind of stands out uh, from every other hero in the game. He has very interesting decision making that you can do while you're playing him and whenever you're deck building for him. Uh, he's very, very powerful. So in my opinion, I think Bishop, I mean, I just took him through the expert campaign of the Age of Apocalypse in uh, True Solo. But I, I'm a true believer that I think he can take down every scenario in expert mode, like Ronin, Venom Goblin, everybody. And I'll definitely be doing a Ronin video uh, sometime very soon in the next few days. And the wow factor. That's just kind of my personal bias, like if, if I was really wowed by this part of it. So uh, for this hero bishop, I think I was very, very wowed by him. Um, he definitely has that wow factor. I think he has a lot of interesting stuff um, that I haven't even explored yet. So I think he's super duper awesome. So let's go ahead and dive into his kit. And we're going to take a look at his cards here. So for bishop, uh, his hero ability right here is energy absorption. It's a response after bishop takes any amount of damage from an attack. This card an equal number of cards on the top of your deck. Add each resource card, this card this way to your hand. So Bishop wants to be taking damage. So he has a 2-2-1 two, two, stat line, one defense, but it doesn't matter because I don't think I've ever defended with his basic defense as Bishop because uh, you want to be triggering the energy absorption here. This originally turned me off from Bishop. I didn't really want to play him because I didn't like that. Uh, you may Even if you put, like let's say, 20 resource cards in your deck, there's no way to guarantee every single time that you're going to draw you know, three resource cards if you take three damage with his energy absorption. So because of that, I wasn't the biggest fan of him, but I don't lean too much into it. I lean into it whenever the situation arises where I know there's a lot of resource cards left in my deck. And I think if you do that, he can be very consistent and very powerful. Um, one of my favorite aspects about him and what I kind of build my Bishop deck around is his Arch Eagle ability right here. So his Arch Eagle, he has a four recovery and a temporary displace is his Arch Eagle uh, response. When you change to this form, so to his Arch Eagle form, from his hero form, you can add a temporal card in your discard pile to your hand. So one really crazy thing is that I think almost all of, or half of Bishop's cards are temporal cards, and the cards that I want to play are usually going to be temporal cards, especially in your Arch Eagle. So for example, if you look at both of his uh, identity-specific allies, they are both temporal cards. His rifle, so his up, uh, both of his upgrades, his uniform and the rifle, temporal cards. Supercharge is kind of like an attack interrupt that you can play uh, later on. It's not a temporal card, but I think I'm okay with that because it's a zero cost upgrade anyways. The Concussive Blast, these are events, uh, his attack event. Command Authority is his story event. You can't play this in Ultra Eagle anyway, so for him to flip down and grab this card doesn't really make that much sense. So I think I'm completely fine with it not being a temporal card. And an Energy Conversion, same thing. It's a defense card you can only play this in hero form. So when he flips down to Ultra Eagle, it's fine that we can't grab this. And then my favorite target for his temporal displace is stored energy here. This is a double resource card, and it's a temporal card. So that means every single time you flip down to Arch Eagle, you can grab a double resource straight to your hand and just tutor this really like nice resource card. And uh, yeah, I mean, if you have something expensive to play, but you can't get it down, just flip down to Arch Eagle and you get that double resource, and then you'll probably be able to play it. So yeah, that's my favorite strategy with Bishop. I like building around that. Um, yeah, I think I think that makes him very very powerful. I think leaning into that is the is how we really unlock his strength. And then uh, a lot of his cards go around those resource cards, right? So if you take a look at his rifle, 
uh, restricted hero action attack, exhaust bishop's rifle. Choose an enemy and deal one damage to an enemy for each resource card in your hand. This attack gains range, right? So a lot of his stuff, a lot of his uh, stuff revolves around those resource cards. And then uh, if we take a look at supercharge here, or actually let's take a look at his, his uniform first. So this is synergy with his uh, hero ability, energy absorption. After you resolve bishop's energy absorption, you can exhaust his uniform. Heal one damage from bishop for each resource card in your hand. So that's a good way, even if you don't have any resource card that you're grabbing with energy absorption, as long as you have a handful of resources already, Bishop's Uniform, you can still trigger it after using his hero ability to heal by whatever it is, um, the resource card in your hand. So that's a good way for him to stay in hero form a lot longer if you don't have a chance to flip down. Supercharge is going to be his big burst card right here, right? So uh, as an action, you can discard a resource card from your hand, and then uh, you can place a charge counter here to a max of four because uh, you can blow this card up and do a plus eight attack to your basic attack, right? So Bishop can just swing for two, and if there's four charge counters on the supercharge, you can discard supercharge, and it does 10 damage, which is insane. He has two copies of it. You can have them both on the field at the same time. And then uh, there's still a little... So people in the community are kind of debating right now whether you can use them both at the same time. But Bishop has so many readies with Concussive Blast and with Utopia that he can just make a basic attack, have the supercharge swing for 10, and then get ready up again, and then swing again for 10. So it's not that big of a deal. Um, but I'm hoping that the ruling is that you can't use them both at the same time because uh, that would be really, really cool to be able to swing for 18, right? Plus 8 max, plus 8 max is going to be 16, and then plus his, uh, his base attack for 2. That's insane burst damage, whether you can use it at the same time or not because uh, he, he can get that ready pr pretty easily uh, being an X-Men. And one of the big sleeper cards for me is his defense event right here. I think this is slowly becoming one of, one of my favorite defense events in the entire game. So energy conversion is a zero-cost event. Hero interrupt defense. It has a defense keyword. So you play this card, you are officially defending, but you don't have to exhaust your hero to defend it, right? Because it has a defense keyword. When an enemy attacks, shuffle each resource card in your discard pile into your deck. You cannot take more than three damage from this attack. That is an insanely bonkers effect. Um, so I love using this card in multiplayer, and I really only notice that looking at the card art here, right? Bishop's kind of like jumping in front of someone and like taking the uh, the damage for them. So this says when an enemy attacks, so any enemy, it doesn't have to be when an enemy is attacking you. So if you're playing multiplayer and uh, someone's the, the villain's attacking your uh, partner, you can play energy conversion. Since it has a defense keyword, the attack is now going to you. So the attack is now redirected at Bishop and you can't take more than three damage from this attack. So it's not that bad. Like you're not going to take like a bunch of damage, right? The max is going to be three. Even if it's like a Ronin hidden for like 15 damage, right? It's, it's just gonna be capped off at three. And then shuffling each resource card and you're just finding your deck, I mean, it's just adding like more power to this card or more funness and just, you know, more awesomeness. Because when you get every resource in your card, there's so many shenanigans that you can do with that, right? Um, what I love to do is plan to have my deck have one card left in the deck. Um, so let's say I have like three cards left in my hand and I see that my deck has three cards left in the deck, right? So I'll purposely, I, I'll keep all three cards in my hand. I won't play anything. And when my turn ends, I'll just draw two more cards back into my hand, set to five, keeping the energy conversion in my hand. And then whenever it's a villain's turn, they attack. I'll play the energy conversion. I have eight resource cards in the deck that I run with Bishop. Shuffle those eight cards back into the deck. So now I have a nine card deck with one non-resource and eight resource cards. So then when I trigger um, his energy absorption, he is like at least drawing two resource cards, probably drawing all three. Uh, drawing them all up and he's only taking three damage from the attack with the um, with the energy conversion but he's for sure healing by at least two or three with the uniform and hopefully even more so i think that energy conversion allows for, for some really really fun unique stuff with bishop um and yeah I, I think that all this just adds to his kit so back to our chart here yeah i think he's because because of that i mean all those things i just said i think it's very very unique i think it's super fun his interesting decision making, right? Because you have to decide when you want to play those energy conversions and if you want to lean into that, right? So there's definitely decks that I've seen where they're leaning entirely into their resources and leaning into his hero ability. For my deck, I like to lean into the Alter Ego ability because it's a little bit more stable, a little more consistent, and then leaning more into build, right? So I think that the way that you play him, the way that you deck build, you can pick different ways for it to work and it's very, very fun. He's super powerful. Um, I think I've shown a lot of his power and uh, I'm going to keep showing a, a lot of playthroughs with him against the strongest villains. And for me, he just has that wow factor. That's just kind of my biased 
um, type of opinion on him, and I really like him. So for all these reasons, Bishop is a five out of five for me. He is like, like a perfect new hero. Um, okay, so let's go ahead and move on here to Magic. She is the second hero in the Age of Apocalypse campaign, and I'm gonna be going through uh, all these categories for her. So let's take a look at her kit really quick as well. So these are the aspect cards, which I will go over in a different video. So Magic here, so Ileana Rasputin. She has a one Thor, two attack, uh, two defense. And then you play with the top card of your deck face up. So as long as she's in hero form, the top card of your deck is going to be face up and you can see what that is. Once for phase, you may play the top card of your deck as variant in your hand, reducing its resource cost by one. One really big thing to know with that is that it's once per phase. So you can do it during the villain phase, reduce it cost by one, and during the hero phase, you can do that again. So if you're playing her defense event, Magic Barrier, if Magic Barrier is on top of your deck, you can play it for free during the villain phase, and during the hero phase, you can play another card reducing its cost by one. If it's a one cost card, you can play it for free, like the Stepping Disc. If there's exorcism, then you have to pay a cost for it, right? But I think that's so powerful, especially if you're leading to playing something during the villain's phase. I personally, because you get to keep all the cards in your hand, you don't have to pay any resources for it. I personally like to play her more for damage, just because I do find that she has a little bit um, less big burst damage. Like, she doesn't have that big burst that Bishop has. But Bishop's very thematic, right, in the way that he's absorbing all the energy and then blasting it back, right? Magic has a bunch of, a lot of damage, but it's like a little small... Uh, instances of damage so I, I personally like to have to have I personally like to have her have bigger player turns I, I'm, a, I'm a Marvel Champions player that likes to have big player turns and uh, do cool things during my own turn but I think if you lean to her stuff for the uh, villain phase that's very powerful too with her effect so uh, her cards here her main card is gonna be Limbo right here so it's a one cost support I found this card pretty essential when playing magic after the villain phase begins, you can exhaust Limbo to swap a card in your hand with the top card of your deck. And then as an action, you can exhaust Limbo, so during your own player phase, because it's an action here, to swap a card in your hand with the top card of your deck. This is a very, very valuable card to manipulate the top card of your deck. And I find that whenever she doesn't have this card, it's a little bit more difficult to do all the stuff that she wants to do. It's a little bit more restrictive. So getting Limbo in, I think, is pretty key for magic. Um, but once she has that set up, she doesn't really need anything else, and this is just a one-cost support. So, yeah, um, she has her upgrades here. Uh, she has her readying card, which is Stepping Disc. This card is very, very cool, because you can ready magic. Choose a magic card in, in your discard pile, not named Stepping Disc, and put it on top of your deck. So when you're doing that, you can manipulate that. So, like, we look at, like, Exorcism here. Remove four threat from the scheme. If the top card of your deck has a mental or a wild resource icon, confuse a villain. All magic's cards revolve around whatever the top card of your deck is, right? If we look at her upgrade, same thing. If the top card is this or this, she gets plus one Thor. If it's this or this, she gets plus one attack. This or this, she gets plus one defense. So stepping this allows you to put whatever magic card in your discard pile on top of your deck so you can trigger whatever effect that you need for that turn, right? And then Colossus is a wild resource card. So if you get him on top of your deck, then you can trigger everything. So yeah, I think that she definitely is super duper fun to play because of that. And there's very interesting decision making that you have to do when you're playing her. And whenever you're deck building for her, I think there's very interesting uh, deck builds that you could do for her as well. Um, leaning more into her kit, leaning more into villain phase, phase, leaning more into the player phase. There's a lot of different things that you can do in Magic. So I think she's super duper fun, super duper awesome hero. So she definitely has a fun factor for me. Um, I think she's very unique, interesting decisions for sure. Powerful, she is super duper powerful. She is a mystic. So she can have the Sorcerer Supreme, that plus one hand size in hero form. And then uh, all, she has very powerful Mystic support cards as well. And being able to look at the top card of your deck and being able to play it once your face is effective giving you the plus one hand size too. So super duper strong. Um, so this is my, my uh, little bullet points for Magic. So Magic I think has everything on paper. For me personally, just my own biased opinion, she doesn't have that wow factor for me. Whenever I was first looking at, at the heroes for uh, Age of Apocalypse, I actually was not excited for Bishop at all. I thought he wasn't going to be that fun to play because of the RNG of his hero ability. Magic, I was actually super duper hyped up for. And, you know, she didn't disappoint. She has everything on paper, but she doesn't click super duper well with me. So that's the only reason why I didn't give the wow factor for her personally. And for Bishop, I mean, he exceeded all my expectations. So that's the only reason why I don't have that for Magic. And for me, she's a 4 out of 5 hero. Very, very strong, very fun. She has everything on paper. Just for my personal preferences, I just find her a little bit difficult to play and too much thinking, right? It's like every single turn I have to decide 
what card to put at the top of my deck. But I think that if that's fun for you, then she's going to have that wow factor for you, right? So it, it's kind of like a player preference. This isn't like, I don't think this is like an objective, like end all be all type of a review for this box. It's just going to be my opinion and what I thought about each hero and each villain. So yeah, that's how I think about magic. All right, so next we have Eunice. This is going to be the first uh, villain that we're going through, uh, scenario number one in the Age of Apocalypse. So let's go ahead and take a look at uh, Eunice's stuff here. So these are the aspect cards for magic. And then for Eunice's cards, okay. So Eunice has, uh, he comes in with toughness. If the amount of threat on gene pool is at least three, he has retaliate one. If it's at least six, he gains star. If it's nine, he has an amplify icon. So the way that Eunice works is that his whole entire uh, encounter set revolves around Gene Pool. So uh, where is Gene Pool? Uh, oh, Gene Pool is one of the encounters, one of the monitor sets, right? So it's not going to be a part of this stuff. So let me skip through all this and kind of spoil a little bit. Okay, so when you're playing um, Eunice, you have to include the Infinite's monitor set. The, the Infinite's monitor set comes with Gene Pool, which is a permanent setup side scheme. So it starts in the game in play already. Does it come in here with four threat? As a force response, after an ally is defeated by anything other than consequential damage, place three threat on here. So this includes retaliate. Um, this includes uh, you know chump blocking, right? Anything that's not consequential damage, you have to put three threat on here. So G pool starts off with full with four, and then all of the cards in the infinite module set revolves around how much threat is on gene pool. So these minions here, if there's at least three threat on gene pool, they have quick strike. If it has at least six, this card will surge, which is super nasty. If it's nine, then they get plus three hit points as well, so they'll have six hit points and surge and quick strike. So whenever you're playing against um, uh, what's his what's his name uh, Eunice, you want to not chump block because then th so much stuff is going to be added to Gene Pool, and that's kind of how his mechanics work. Uh, a lot of his cards revolve around Gene Pool here as well, right? So when reviewed, if there's at least three, give Eunice toughness. Six hue three from Eunice, uh, and the nine give him additional boost card for his activation, right? So a lot of things um, can happen based on uh, how much there is on gene pool. So I think for that reason, let's go back to the chart here. So I think Eunice is very, very fun for uniqueness. I think he's a very, very unique um, villain in Marvel Champions because he really deters that chump block. He doesn't have like much overkill or anything like that, but you don't want to block with allies all the time because then you're going to add threat to gene pool. The, the decision making I think is also very, very awesome because you have to decide Am I going to chump block at this time because I'm going to die, or am I going to remove threat from gene pool? Uh, you have to really decide when and how to remove threat from gene pool to keep that down so that you can uh, take units down. His power, I don't think he's that strong a villain. He's definitely more on the easier side, which makes sense because he's the first scenario of the game so, or of the uh, campaign and the expansion. So I think that's fair that he's not the strongest villain. And then uh, the wow factor, I mean, he has for me. I think he's a super duper fun to play. So this would be my. Uh, rankings here for Eunice. I think he has his fun, has uni uniqueness, has interesting decisions. He's not very strong, but he has that wow factor for me. So I think as a scenario, he is definitely a four out of five. I love playing Eunice. He's definitely a very replayable uh, villain. I think I want to play him a lot more in the future. Super duper cool. Okay, so next we have um, the four horsemen here, and I put the picture of Angel here, but uh, or Archangel. But yeah, this would be the uh, review for this. I think the four horsemen. Let's let's take a look at them. So this is a very cool scenario. It has four villains here, and they both have an A side and a B side, depending on if you're playing on expert mode or not. So we have war, famine, pestilence, and death. And then they each have a force response that triggers whenever they attack, right? So we take a look at death. After death attacks you, if he has at least one hit point, do one damage to each character you control, and each one of these guys have an effect, right? So for um, famine, it's going to be discard top 10 cards of your deck after she attacks. War is uh, discard upgrade support you control. And then Pestilence is uh, treat your identity text box as if it were blank. So you blank out your text box. So I think that this scenario is very, very cool. And a lot of their encounter cards revolve around making them activate more, right? So I think one of the nastiest cards is this boost effect here, um, right here. So if you get this as a boost card, it says after this activation, Famine activates against you. Do not give Famine a boost card for the activation. The boost card doesn't matter because when they activate, they're going to trigger this effect again. So if Famine attacks you, and she gets it as her boost, she's going to attack again and trigger this effect again where this card top 10 cards of her deck. So if that stacks up, that could be very, very difficult. I think this scenario can definitely be very difficult um, because of that. And then, um, yeah, yeah. So I think it's a very, very fun 
very unique scenario. You had to defeat all four of them to win the game. But if you get them down to zero, they still activate against you. So you have to get all four down to zero. Um, but when you do get them down to zero, then it won't show you this effect. Because it says after Fame attacks you if she has at least one hit point. So if you get it down to zero, then uh, you know they won't show you that effect anymore, which makes it a little bit easier. But you still have four of them to, to get down, and then uh, they're just going to constantly activate and trigger that effect. So for the four horsemen, I think that they are super duper fun because of the, that four... Uh, like the four uh, villains there. And then I think they're super unique because in the way that you have to decide when, uh, which one you want to trigger and you have to try to counteract that. The decision making is very fun as well because for me, I like to flip down to Alter Ego a lot, which helps a lot for this scenario because when you flip down, then they're scheming and they don't trigger that force response, which only triggers another attack. So there's a lot of interesting decisions that you can make, which one you want to take down first to stop their effect, um, how are you going to counter their, their effects, stuff like that. So I think that every single time you play them, it's going to be very unique and very different. So I think they are very, very cool. They're unique from every other scenario in the uh, game of Marvel Champions um, because of that mechanic. So I think, yeah, and I think they're very powerful here as well. And for me, they have that wow factor. They are a very, very awesome scenario. Definitely one of my uh, more favorite scenarios. So for the four horsemen here, uh, I have five out of five awesome scenario. They, they check every uh, box for me. Um, definitely another great scenario in Marvel Champions. All right, so next we have Apocalypse 1. He's the third scenario in the Marvel Champions campaign. Let's take a look at him. So he is right here. So the third scenario with Apocalypse here, I think he is very, very fun, very, very epic. He feels like a journey. He feels like a combination of the Magneto scenario from Mutant Teen Genesis and the uh, Hela scenario from Mad Titan Shadow. You can't just outright kill him. You have to do all the stuff. You have to defeat his prelude minions. You have to defeat his side schemes. So, um, okay. So, he has one main scheme here. And X is equal to whatever his printed hit point values is. So, if you're facing him on easy, it's going to be 8. Uh, 9 on uh, a standard, because you start on stage 2. And then if he's on stage 3, uh, then you're playing him on expert with uh, 10. And then stage 4 is if he gets if he evolves and gets to stage 4. Then it will be 11 here, and that will be the threat threshold for what the main scheme is. Every single time the main scheme threats out, if you're starting on here on stage 1, he'll change to stage 2 in power up. If you're on stage 2, he'll change to stage 3. And it doesn't matter either way if you're playing him on standard or an expert. He'll keep changing forms until he goes all the way up to stage 4. But if you're playing him on expert, if the main scheme pops once, he already goes to stage 4. If you're playing him on easy mode, it, you have to pop the main scheme 1, 2, 3 times for him to hit stage 4. So either way, I think it's very, very fun. It's very thematic because he's actually powering up if he gets his schemes off and he becomes a lot more powerful. On stage 4 here, right, with 3 scheme, 3 attack. His attacks have overkill. He has star wars and toughness. So just very, very cool. Um, yeah, and then when he's on stage 4 and the main scheme um, pops, then the players lose the game. But for all the other stages, the players don't lose yet. So I think that's a very, very cool mechanic. He has these side schemes here, the Heart of the Empire. You have to clear this off, but you can't clear it off while there's a prelate minion in play. So you had to defeat the minion, clear it off. Then you get another side scheme. So you're kind of like going up the tower. And then uh, there's another probably minion, you know, kind of another like mini boss fight that they take down. Defeat it, defeat the side scheme, go up the tower again, get to the tyrant's throne. Same exact thing, defeat the probably minion, defeat this. And then after you do that, Apocalypse is no longer worthy. He gets his attachment and now he can finally defeat Apocalypse. So I love that journey for Apocalypse. Uh, super duper fun, very thematic. And I find it very, very challenging here as well. So let's go ahead and go back to the uh, chart here. So for all those reasons, I think he's very fun. I think he is unique. He has a little bit of Magneto stuff uh, from the Magneto scenario. He has a little bit of the Hela stuff, but I think that he is unique in his own right. And I enjoy the journey going up the tower for him. And I like those prelate minions kind of guarding it. You could argue that it's not that unique um, because it's very similar to Hela, but I do think that Hela is kind of a one-off in Marvel Champions. And she in her own right is very unique. So to have a scenario like her, I'm gonna give him that point as well. I think there's very, very interesting decision making to make in this third scenario because you have to decide when you want to pop those uh, side schemes or not pop them, but defeat those side schemes and when you want to get the next play minion. Because every single time that happens, there's a lot of pressure being pushed at you at once. Uh, each one of the side schemes has more acceleration. So it's gonna be a little bit more difficult if you pop them all at once without planning and building up your board. So I think that there's very interesting decisions that you can make. I think he's very powerful. I think he's actually one of the stronger uh, villains in uh, the uh, campaign. Uh, so he definitely has that check for me, and he has a wow factor for me as well. So for the third scenario for Apocalypse, 
I got him. I have everything for him. I think he checks off all things again. Um, yeah, I mean, this expansion, Age of Apocalypse, I think has is definitely not disappointing. It has like every single thing. It has like amazing heroes, amazing villains. I think everything is getting checked off. Um, it's a super duper awesome expansion. Uh, okay, so let's go ahead and get to the fourth scenario, which is Dark Beast here. So for Dark Beast, let's take a look at his stuff. So after you defeat Apocalypse, Dark Beast is trying to go into his time machine and uh, revive uh, revive Dark Beast. Or revive, not Dark Beast, uh, Apocalypse to bring him back. So uh, let's see, his mechanic here is you're kind of battling in the time machine. Um, and because of that, you're flipping through all these different things. So let me see, it says here, set the Blue Moon, Genosha, and Savage Land sets aside. So I, I gotta go over there to uh, show you guys. So... Dark Beast revolves around the Savage Lands, right? If you're teleported through a time machine and you end up in the Savage Lands, um, or if you end up in Genosha, or you end up in the Blue Moon, right? So that's kind of where you're kind of like teleporting around. And then uh, you want to, basically, he'll have a setting environment. So the main card here for Savage Land is going to be the Savage Land. Set up the Villain Gans Retaliate 1, and a special here is to discard top three cards of your deck. And then for Genosha, the Villain Gans Steady, place one third on the main scheme is a special. And then Blue Moon says each minion gains guard. Special is D1 damage to your identity. So the special is just kind of the text on the card. It doesn't trigger unless something else triggers it, right? So there'd be like a minion here where it says you are confused. If you are already confused, resolve the special ability of the setting environment, right? So this in play doesn't inherently trigger the special, but um, there's a lot of effects in Dark Beast's kit that triggers those specials. So if we go back to Dark Beast, um, he has a Force Interrupt. And it's the same thing for all three uh, versions of him. Uh, from uh, version 1, version 2, and version 3. When Dark Beast attacks you, resolve the special ability of the setting environment. So every single time that he attacks you, you're going to trigger that special, whether it's adding a threat to the main scheme, taking damage, or it's carrying three cards off the top of your deck. So it could be really nasty if he gets a lot of activations because he'll trigger that over and over again. One thing that I like to do with him is slip down to Arc Eagle because if you notice here, it's only whenever he attacks you. So when he activates, if he schemes, he is not triggered his force interrupts. So that's kind of a way to relieve pressure. But he does have a lot of scheme because he is Dark Beast, a, a, a brute genius. So he has three scheme here, and then he only has one main scheme, which is 10. So if this hits 10, then we do lose the game. Um, but yeah, I think that he's very, very cool. A lot of his cards revolve around um, his, his activations and getting those minions into play, right, with his cool experiments and powering them up. So yeah, Dark Beast. Uh, Dark Beast is definitely a fun scenario for me. I, I do like him a lot. I don't think he's that unique. He does have, um, yeah, I mean, you, you can argue that he is unique uh, because he has those things. So I, I actually, yeah, I, I do think he is unique. Uh, he's similar to Venom Goblin in a type of way to where he has those specials and it, and it can trigger. So I, I think because of those smaller sets and because of that, he does stand out from all the other scenarios in Marvel Champions. He does have that unique mechanic of triggering the specials on setting environments and having those modern sets get into the encounter deck. Um, for interesting decisions... I don't think there's really that many decision making that you can make when you're facing Dark Beast. You're kind of just, the only thing is going to be flipping down to Archer Eagle. And other than that, you're just kind of just bursting him down. Right? There's nothing else that you're really interacting with. You're just kind of going to gun him down. Uh, for powerful, I don't think he's very powerful. Uh, he's definitely one of the easier scenarios in, in the game um, or in the uh, expansion. I think he's around units level, if not a little bit easier. And for a while factor, I mean, he doesn't have that for me personally. So for Dark Beast... I should have him uh, two out of five. I think he's definitely one of the weaker scenarios of the game in terms of like uh, how good it is. Um, but he still has the funness for me. I think he was definitely still a fun experience. So I enjoy him a lot and I definitely still want to play him more. Uh, it's not like, oh, he wasn't fun at all. So that's really good that he's still fun. For uniqueness, I do think that he has a little bit of stuff that makes him stand out with those uh, with those setting environments. And it's a like fun mechanic. It's just not too much interactions with, uh, with the player. And then I don't think he's that powerful. So yeah, for him, uh, he's going to be a 2 out of 5. Let's go ahead and move on to the 5th and final scenario of the uh, Age of Apocalypse uh, expansion, which is Apocalypse 2, uh, where Beast got him back from the uh, from the past. So he is like all young in his prime, uh, and we're going to take him on again. So Apocalypse 2 and Savonir, he has three forms. So he has, uh, well, he has three stages, right? So it's going to be stage 1, stage 2, and stage 3. So on Expert Mode, you start on Stage 2, and then with Stage 3. On Standard, you start on Stage 1, and then with Stage 2. But the card himself, 
there's three sides. It's like aiming a wasp, right? So he has his front side. You flip it behind, he has a back side, and you can open up the card, if you can see right here, for this giant form. It's a huge card where you're opening it up and it folds right here in the middle, right? So he has three different forms, and he's constantly flipping from his Balmore form, his Cyberpath form, and his giant form. And each time you change one of his forms, he has a force response, right? When you change to this form, he deals with indirect damage, and he has a permanent uh, overkill in this form. In this form, he has permanent retaliate one. When you change it here, you place one threat on each scheme in play, which could get really nasty. And this one, he has stalwart permanently, and then uh, when you change this form, you heal one damage from him. So I think that Apocalypse uh, for N. Sabanur is super duper fun, very, very unique, because he's changing in those different forms, and you have to kind of counteract which form you have him in, right? If he's in the Star Wars form, you cannot center and confuse him, so you gotta like, you know, change your strategy if you're playing on Sunday and confusing him. If he's in the uh, overkill form, then you can't chump block. It just gives a lot of unique decisions that the player can make. And that to me is very, very fun because you're constantly deciding when you want him to change forms and when you don't want to change forms and what cards you have in your hand to uh, fit against each form. And then uh, what I like to do is he has a side scheme here, or he has a bunch of these side schemes. So let me see. Um, so a lot of his cards change forms and these side schemes here. So side schemes are the only thing that kind of stays in play, right? So the side scheme says, when defeated, if Apocalypse is in Balmore form, he activates against the player who defeated the scheme. Otherwise, change Apocalypse to Balmore form, give him a tough stats card. So some of these side schemes, I like to actually keep them out and wait for whenever I want him to change forms to, to do this, right? So for example, if he's uh, if I have the side scheme out and he's already in you know Balmore form or in Sapphire form, I just leave it in play. And then if for whatever reason I really want to confuse him because I have like Professor X in my hand and then he's in giant form uh, right here, so he has stalwart, that's whenever I will clear off the side scheme so that he'll change the battle more form so then I can confuse him. I think that makes for a lot of fun and interesting uh, decision making opportunities and it makes him super duper fun. And uh, yeah, I think he is a very, very awesome scenario. Uh, let's go ahead and go back to the chart here. So for me, Apocalypse, he has a fun factor. He's very unique with his form flipping, very interesting decision making because you can decide, you know, based on what form is, what you do. And then he's very, very powerful. I think he's definitely a strong scenario. Not one of the strongest capstone villains in the game, like not uh, near Ronin or Venom Gotten level, but I think he's still very powerful in his own right. And to me, because of that form flipping, because of all that stuff, he has that wow factor. So Apocalypse 2 to me has everything as well. He's a five out of five uh, scenario. 5 out of 5 villain, I love facing him. He's definitely one of the uh, villains I'm going to face a lot uh, again in the future. So yeah, these are all the uh, the two heroes and the five uh, scenarios and five villains of the uh, Age of Apocalypse expansion. And I think that really the developers hit everything like right on the head. Everything, my ratings here, I mean, I liked everything a lot. If you guys have talked to me, you guys know that I'm a huge fan of this expansion. It's definitely one of the better expansions and maybe even one of the best ones. I think everything is so developed. Um, it's like they really know what they're doing with the game. Um, yeah, I mean, it's super duper awesome. I think everything kind of hit uh, very, very well. Uh, the only thing that I would change is that I wish that Apocalypse was more difficult on the Capstone villain here because we have two vers versions of him anyway, so it would be cool to have that really tough challenge. Um, Dark Beast, I wish there was a little bit more to him, maybe like a more powerful factor because um, he is a fourth scenario. But I'm not complaining because he is still very, very fun. And then for Eunice, I think it's okay that he's lacking that powerful thing uh, because he is the first scenario. So you kind of want to like bring him um, like ease into the uh, campaign and ease into the expansion. And then Magic, I mean, she has everything as well on paper. It's just for me personally, she didn't really click that well with me. Um, okay, so next, this is the mission um, support card right here. And I'm going to be kind of talking about the mission side schemes and how the campaign works. So... The uh, Age of Apocalypse was my first um, big campaign, right? right? I did the Mojo Man campaign, which is a mini campaign, but this was my first five scenario campaign. And uh, I posted all the playthroughs for you guys to see. And uh, one thing that I took a look at for the campaign compared to other, every other campaign is that the really only thing that changes from playing these scenarios as standalone scenarios or in a campaign together are these missions, right? Everything else kind of stays the exact same. The missions is the only thing that changes this. And uh, this is like the mission team card, right? So there's a mission mechanic. Basically, you have this card. You can exhaust it to choose to reduce the cost of the next ally played to the mission by two, or you make a mission attempt. You have this kind of set-aside area called the mission area, 
where uh, basically you have a side scheme. So you only have one side scheme there. And then uh, it's like, for example, liberate the Seattle core or sabotage the seawall. So you have a specific mission that you have to do as a part of the campaign, like protect the professor. And then you have to put allies towards that mission. And then when they're in the mission, they're no longer under your control. And they are in play, but they kind of aren't. So a lot of the cards that don't affect the mission area don't affect those allies. But if it does affect the mission area, then it does affect the allies. And the card will say if it affects the mission area or not. So they are in play and they kind of aren't. And then uh, when you put those allies there, you don't use them anymore because they're no longer under your control. So you kind of lose that ally from your deck and they just stay in the mission. And until you defeat the mission, uh, you, you get the allies back when you defeat the mission. But if you don't, they just stay in the mission. And I think for me, this is probably the biggest miss um, in the uh, Age of Apocalypse expansion. I think that this really bogged down a lot of the scenarios, if not all of them. So for me, the missions were not fun. I did not find them uh, very, very fun. I found them more tedious than fun. I found like we just had to do a lot more extra stuff. Um, and it wasn't, I don't know, it, it just, I felt like the scenarios itself uh, individually were all fun. But I found that playing the mission with them, it kind of just adds this extra thing on and the rewards are very, very lackluster as well. So it's kind of like, why am I doing all this work to not really get anything? It just didn't feel good to me. For the uniqueness, it is a very unique mechanic because it is a new mechanic that was introduced. So I definitely give it a point for that. I think that, you know, I don't think we've ever seen anything like this before in any previous expansion. So I think that, you know, the missions are very unique uh, for decision making. I think that there's very non-interesting decision making when you're playing the mission, right? You pretty much just want to clear the campaign, control it, and then you can put allies to the mission. And if the campaign you're playing on standard or like the uh, scenario is very, very easy, like maybe units or dark beasts, then you can gradually just throw allies in the mission, but they make your actual play weaker. And then whenever you finally clear the mission, um, then you can get this, uh, you can flip mission team over. And when you flip it over, it's basically an, an Avengers Mansion, right? You can exhaust it and choose a player to draw a card. So, I mean, that's a nice power-up to have for the rest of the game, but it's definitely not worth everything that you had to put towards a mission to do that. I wish that that was a little bit of a stronger effect so, to give you more incentive to clear the mission early so you can flip the mission team side over and get that effect. So, um, yeah, I think that decision-making is not very interesting. You have to really just either control the scenario and then uh, put everything towards the mission and clear it, or you just focus on a mission and then you weaken the way that you kind of play throughout the entire game. So I don't think it's that fun in that way either. Uh, for powerful, I'm gonna evaluate this kind of like as if if I think that it's, uh, if I think the rewards are good. I think the rewards are super duper lackluster. Um, only playing the Mojo Mania um, mini campaign going into this, Mojo Mania lets you start the next scenario with a support or upgrade in play already, which I think is insane. This one allows you to grab a support or, or upgrade from a different aspect, put it in your deck, but you don't start with it in play. So it's like you still have to play it anyways. That is very cool and fun to do, but you just don't get to start with it in play. So uh, I don't think it's as strong as being able to start with something. And then, uh, because you're also not paying for its cost whenever you do that. And then um, the other stuff, like there's one reward that I didn't even take where you get like a one cost upgrade for an ally. I didn't even want that uh, diluting my deck. And then another one, you can get one of these allies here. So there's four campaign allies. Uh, Destiny, Blink, Morph, and X-Men. And I think they do have nice effects, right? When Blink enters your hand, do two damage to the villain. When Morph enters your hand, confuse the villain. When X-Men enters your hand, give your identity a tough status card, right? So like, I think that there is some interesting stuff, but at the same time, they're not like that much of a game changer. I think that they're nice when they enter your hand, but I mean, it's not worth all the effort that you had to do to clear these missions. And then uh, this was the upgrade I'm talking about, Desperate Measures, it's a one cost upgrade. Attached to an ally, you can give it to a mission ally or an ally that's in play. They get plus one Thor, plus one attack, plus one hit point. So yeah, I mean, this could be very good if you're playing a uh, Voltron type of deck where you want to power your allies, but I wasn't playing that, so I didn't want that card uh, anywhere in my deck. So yeah, and then definitely the wild factor, as you guys pro can probably guess, I was not the biggest fan of the missions. So uh, this is my evaluation for the missions. I give it a one out of five. I think it is unique because there's nothing else like it, but I don't think that it was executed uh, in the best way. It was not fun. It kind of made every scenario a little bit less fun, but they were also fun just because I think each standalone scenario was very, very cool um, and very, very good in its own right. Um, so I do think the mission team was a little bit of a miss, um, but that being said, I heard that developers do not care that much or as much about the campaigns as they do about each standalone scenario. So with that in mind, I think that they still did a great job because each standalone scenario was awesome 
and uh, the campaign together uh, just wasn't the best thing. Finally, I'm going to be going over uh, my personal opinion of the standard three sets right here. So let's take a look at that. So this box also introduced standard three, which is a new, uh, a new way to play. So standard three comes in with Pursue by the Past. This is a permanent setup, so you start uh, the game with this if you are playing standard three. So there's four spots here. After you place a pursuit counter here, if the number of pursuit counters here is at least three, more than the number of players, so you're playing on solo, then it's four counters, two players, five, three players, six, and then a seven for four players. Uh, if there's at least three more than the number of players here, they remove each pursuit counter, and if your nemesis is in play, it activates against you, otherwise flip this card over. So yeah, that is a much more guaranteed way to get your nemesis mini into play without you getting you getting on the first turn and just like ruining your entire game right so all the cards here revolve around pursue by the past right so it, it, they revolve on these pursuit counters so if you get dark designs it's similar to advance whenever you place one pursuit counter on pursue by the past so you have to do that then if there's any counters on it the villain schemes so it's it's a great way to kind of like balance it out right if you place a counter on it and then there's four that you remove all the counters right away so then there's no counters on it and then in dark designs the villain will not scheme but the dark designs will actually trigger and get out your nemesis minion instead of the villain scheming, right? If it doesn't get out the nemesis minion, then you're then the villain will scheme. So either way, you're getting some sort of bad effect, but you're only getting one, not getting both. So I think it's a cool balancing way. I think it's a very, very unique mechanic. Uh, Sinister Strike is a similar thing, right? So place a pursuit counter on pursuit by the past. Then if there's any counters, the villain attacks. Evil Alliance, each nemesis in play activates. If none of them activate, you place three counters on pursuit by the past. They all have uh, similar boost effects, right? So after this activation resolves, place one pursuit counter on pursuit by the past. Um, nowhere is safe, same thing, place a pursuit counter. Uh, yeah, so I think that this is a very, very awesome uh, set. And I think that this is kind of the way to play Marvel Champions now, um, including the standard three sets. Even if you're playing Expert 1 or Expert 2, I think just throwing the standard three, uh, it's gonna add a lot more to your experience. I think that it's fun having the Nemesis Minion slowly creep up on you. I think that this was like an awesome, a uh, new mechanic that they introduced in the game. So for me, I think standard three is very, very fun. I think it's very unique. I think there's very interesting deci decision-making uh, opportunities as well because you see those counters coming up. So for me, for example, um, let's go back really quick. So for me, when, when I was playing Bishop a lot with the standard three sets, Bishop's nemesis minion, Trevor Fitzroy, he has quick strike. So right here, this is a Bishop a nemesis minion. He has two scheme, three attack, five hit points, and quick strike. So one thing is whenever I see the pursuit counters building up and I know that it's like at three and it's about to pop and hit four, and I know I'm getting Trevor Fitzroy very, very soon, it's cool because I can make the decision to flip down to Arctic Eagle because quick strike only triggers if your hero is in hero form, right? Because quick strike means that the minion will attack uh, the hero that it's engaged with. So if it's engaged with an Arctic Eagle, it's not going to attack you. So I do think that because of that, because you're knowing when your nemesis will uh, kind of come, you can plan for around that for whatever your nemesis is and make some interesting decisions to uh, counter that. And then powerful, I don't think it's very powerful. I think it's you know kind of more or less on the same as standard one. It's definitely not a standard two or expert one type of difficulty. It's more balanced in that you're more likely to see your nemesis minion, but it's still not guaranteed. So I have played some games, like you know 40 minute, 50 minute games where my nemesis minion has not come out. So it's still a possibility that that doesn't come out, but um, it's just a more slow ramp up of it coming out. So it's not super strong, but it has, I don't think it's intended to be because it is a standard set, right? It's, it's not supposed to be like, you know, the hardest thing. Uh, it's supposed to kind of be equivalent to standard one. And a wild factor, I mean, because of the pursuit counters and all that stuff, I love it a lot. I think that it definitely has that wild factor for me. So for the standard sets, I give it a four out of five. It has everything that it is intended to have. It's just, it just doesn't have the power, but I don't really want to have the power anyways, right? Because it is a standard set that's supposed to be similar to standard one. So because of that, I think it's, uh, you know, four, four out of five for the ratings, but that's just kind of my evaluations because uh, power is a uh, category, but maybe it shouldn't even, even be a category, right? Um, I think standard three is everything that we wanted it to be. So yeah, very, very cool. So yeah, this is my um, chart, and uh, this is kind of how I'm evaluating all the stuff in the Age of Apocalypse uh, expansion. I thought the two heroes were bangers. I thought almost all the scenarios were also really good. And I thought that the uh, the campaign, I thought was a little bit not as good. And then uh, I thought that the, uh, the standard three sets was very, very good as well. So yeah, overall, 
I mean, I think the Age of Apocalypse um, expansion is one of the best products in Marvel Champions. I think that everything is super developed. The direction how, that they're going, everything is very well designed. Very, very awesome box. Um, I definitely recommend getting it. I'm going to be playing it a lot more. And I like to play standalone scenarios anyway. So I think as standalone scenarios, these are very, very awesome. Uh, I probably won't do the campaign again. Just not the biggest fan of um, you know this type of campaign with the with the side uh, missions, but I mean everything else completely hits. Also, that I really care about, um, I really enjoyed. Um, in the campaign, I'm not that much of a campaign guy anyway, so I think I'm I don't really mind that much that I didn't really enjoy this part of it. And maybe those of you guys that enjoy campaigns might like this a lot more than um, than I do. So yeah, there you guys uh, go. That is my review of the uh, expansion. Let me know what you guys think. If you agreed or disagreed with anything, let me know if there's anything that I missed. Do you guys like Bishop more or uh, Magic more? Um, do you guys sleep on Bishop like I did and realize that he was like way cooler than Magic? Or is Magic better the entire time? Um, let me know what you guys think and uh, I will see you guys in the next one.